thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Mikhail Antana. I am the field specialist. And we have here Miss Jessie Jim. She is the field coordinator. And we have on here as well our project director, Dr. Michael Patrick, coming from NMSU. And um, I want to thank all of you guys for joining us this evening for our cattle co-op webinar that will be presented by Stuart Romero. He is coming from the Cedillo Cattle Association, if I'm saying that correctly. Okay, all right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you all on here. Uh, like, thank you for NSA asking me to present this evening. Um, I wish it would be a little bit in person, so I could try to give a show lamb away like I did try to do last time again, but I don't think they'll allow me to do that. But uh, other than that, uh, like I said, good evening, afternoon to all of y'all. Uh, just a little background on myself. I am Stuart Romero, a tribal member for the Pueblo of Laguna. I am a fourth generation rancher. And my education background, I did go to NMSU for a year and a half. So I went through the whole range, uh, animal range science. Um, program so I have a little bit of background there but like I said just if you guys have any questions just go ahead and give me a, a shout or a stop or something and then um, I'll gladly to answer but uh, but here here you go this is pretty much what we're what the Cedillo brand is the slash 52 on the left hip so pretty much Cedillo was formed and mandated by the tribe and the BIA to deal with drought and overgrazing. Um, that was uh, due, that drought and overgrazing was due to uh, a lot of the tribal members having livestock, sheep, horses within the villages. So a little knowledge is that the tribe went ahead and purchased these land grants out east of the Pueblo from the last village of Masita. So from that, they went ahead and des designated certain areas to put your livestock, your sheep, and your horses out there. Um, so Dale, we are one of the original cattle associations by the Pueblo. Uh, Montano and Diamondel are also original um, associ cattle associations along with Cedillo. But uh, Bar Piel, Doe Mountain, Bell Rock, and Turquoise Springs are fairly new to the um, cattle associations that are within uh, that are here within the Pueblo. And then our range, I couldn't really find a map to show uh, the boundaries of of um, where our grazing unit is at. But uh, Cedillo. We are pretty much located from mile marker 126 on I-40, and it stretches east to the real Perkle, pretty much for Route 66 Casino is. Our grazing unit runs on the north and the south side of I-40. Uh, we go by uh, Tahajuli exit. Our unit goes all the way, and we board Tahajuli. And then on the south side from Highway 6, where Highland Meadows ends about mile marker three or four east, all the way, same thing, both on north and south side of Highway 6, and our boundary ends at the real Perkle. So we pretty much have a good size uh, grazing unit. It's close to a little over 95,000 acres, and then within the our grazing unit, we have different pastures that are pretty much uh, divided um, into more pastures. So, so this is pretty much right here is I'm showing you is I looked in the archives and these are pretty much basically the original members of the associations. So there's 41. So there's four, there was originally 48 brand um, brand owners on the that um, had livestock down there, 
So you can tell, you know, we have all the brands, the people, uh, the earmarks all on one side. And then this side, all the way to your right side is pretty much our current roster. Um, 31, 31 members. And if you look, Sadio has its own brand on there. So there's 30 people all together. And you can tell on some of them that the brands have continued on through generations and have been passed down um, accordingly by family or by, um, yeah, by family. So the way we operate, we do have a governing body function. Uh, we have a president, a vice president, a secretary, and two board members. And the way officers are elected is we'll have a, a gen meeting call for all members of the, all brand owners of the association and pretty much will go ahead and nominate who they think will sit in these offices. There's no campaigning, nothing. So it's pretty much just a regular raise your hand vote. And that's how you get put into office. And our terms run two year terms. So this coming year is pretty much our term that is um, gonna be up. And pretty much it's self-explanatory. You know, the president is the, the main power or governing body that has the th signature authority that has to do with any business within the association. Vice president, vice president, he is there in case the president is not there whenever we have a business to take care of. Uh, secretary uh, office I am currently holding, I'm pretty much the one that takes care of all the paperwork, the records for association. Um, if the president cannot make it to say a uh, meeting with NRCS or uh, FSA or with tribal leadership or anything like that, I'm pretty, pretty much the one that will go in there um, and uh, step in um, also pretty much um, in charge of getting all the vaccine, making sure we have everything for Brandon. Um, and the main person that tells everybody when we're gonna be having meetings, work, or if there's something going on at the ranch. And then the treasurer, of course, is the one that um, just takes care of the, the money that has power signature over the bank accounts. And then um, on our bank accounts, uh, it's really left up to the president who has access to the bank accounts, but pretty much we are given, um, there's four of us that have a debit, debit credit cards tied to the um, banking uh and then our two board members are kind of like our lower seats they're pretty much like the as you would say a learning position on there so so that's how they get elected to um weekly turn uh, along you know how how else we govern uh each member is paired to have a weekly turn so during their weekly turns, it's their week out at the ranch just to go and monitor, you know, check water, check fences, check the livestock, and, you know, do any necessary repairs that need to be done. Um, they'll usually call us if they can, or if they need help, they'll usually call us, or if it's something a little too big, then we'll call in help to um, get whatever the problem is fixed. And then we also have, um, Fines and fees, uh, you are assessed a $50, $50 fee if you miss a called work day or if you miss your weekly round turns. But you can also hire a, a person, a hand um, to work for you on those call work, work days so you won't um, be assessed that $50 fine. And 
there there are excuses we have in our bylaws like um if it's like a family emergency family death uh village work public work uh religious ceremonies you're participating in stuff like that you'll go ahead and um end up getting excused for that day and we do also we do have bylaws that govern ourselves and that the the tribe and ENRD our environment environmental natural resources people look at just in case uh, if we have any disputes or if we get taken into court um, like it says it's a it's a living document we can change things according to how we or you would want them to to say but um, but we've also um, looked at legal counsel, just um, kind of looking over the language, making sure everything pretty much ties into each other or backs each other up. And right here, pretty much, like I said, um, this is how our weekly schedule is paired. It's a, a yearly, um, a yearly schedule. So yeah, like right here, it says uh, January 4th through January 10th, 2021. It's so-and-so's person and pretty much it just rolls on down like that. So each member, uh, you kind of already have an idea of, of when your turn is coming up and this at least allows and gives people time to take off of work because uh, most of us, most of the memberships do have a regular job. So that gives them time to take off um, then on this side pretty much it's just uh, when we have our general meetings or whenever we have um, call work days we'll pretty much make a whole schedule we'll make a spring schedule our brand in summer schedule and then our fall um, schedule too so it just pretty much gives the membership um, make some aware of when we'll start working then on the on the bottom of course individuals attending village work traditional activities will be excused um they're just reminded to provide proper equipment and tools whenever we are busy uh, or whatever kind of um, work is called for and then right here on your left side is pretty much the real old bylaws you can tell um, that the pencil in or started scratching off some of the language in there to make it uh, a little better and then on your right side right here is pretty much the current bylaws uh, as of today probably seven about five years ago we went in and um, reviewed and started revising the bylaws but we never finished or um got uh, that far i know there were some sections in there that had to do with public public safety that we had to get clarifications but the this is um the right side is pretty much active on on what we're doing okay now we do have within association we do have a bull program all the bulls that are purchased wear the 52 brand no individual brand owner owns any bulls everything is owned by the association all bulls that we buy have to be registered uh, if they're um herefords pulled herefords angus composite bulls balance bulls galve uh, whatever it is they do have to come with their certificate of registration and then all bulls are before they're when they are brought to within the pueblo lands they do have to have a clean bill of health and we do purchase virgin bulls on them um, for for the association uh do, 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 do. Every year, 
around February, March, we do trick and fertility test the bulls just to make sure um, nothing's wrong with them, but especially with fertility, if one flunks, do we give them? It's really up to whoever the boss man is. If we if we need to go and um, retest them, or just go ahead and get rid of them. Um, pretty much our breed breeds consist of you know the Herefords, Polt Herefords, uh, Angus, Red Angus, Balancers, uh, Composite Bulls. Um, when we first got into it, our cross breeding was. Um, we breed, uh, we bred them with uh, brave fruits, and just you know, uh, for a little bit more information for you to read on, you know, these are pretty much the the symbols or what we look at in their pedigrees. I know uh, a lot of people are starting to to go this route with the whole EPD um, EPD. Um, um, standard so so when you're looking at bulls you know this is pretty much just the basic of what we always what we consider looking at you know your actual birth and weight cavity so you won't really have to worry about your cows uh, giving birth to really big bulls or you having to pull calves out weaning weights uh, just gives you a good idea of what that calf may potentially look like same thing with your yearling weights is a big factor especially when you're looking at keeping replacement heifers for your for your um, your crowd and then um of course milk milk and gain ribeye all play a part in the whole fertility on the um on the cow side maternal side and when also when um, your pigment on your Hereford bulls, you always look for a lot of that. And then, uh, of course, that's supposed to say disposition. I don't know, it got changed. But, you know, how, how easy are these bulls to work with or handle? I know that's a really big thing, you know, is, can, is it safe to work around them? And then that will pretty much give you an idea of how their offspring will, what their attitude will be pretty much. And then right here is just pretty much, uh, I threw in a couple pictures of uh, the type of bulls we look at. You know, this was at uh, Kyle uh, the Press bull cell out near Nero Vista to come carry. Uh, he does Herefords and Ingus. Uh, like you said, like I said, you know, you try to look for that pigment in those her fruit bulls so it could pass on to those cows. Um, same thing with, well, you won't have to really worry about with Angus, but you know, Angus is pretty much a a sought, at, sought out to breed right now, uh, especially with the black baldies that you have going on. And then this is just this is just a little video. Uh, this past year we did go to Perez uh, bulls bull cell so this is pretty much how they do an auction so i thought this would be really cool for you guys to listen in to So pretty much um, we bought, we didn't buy any hair fruits this year. We went all Angus. We bought uh, six, six to eight bulls from him this past year. So that's pretty much what we brought back. Um, our breeding program is um, breeding program. We pretty much now as of today run close to 450 mama cows and a hundred heifers on uh, 28 to 30 bulls so far that's not even including the calf crop from this year that we weaned um but uh but we do run a 90 day program we try to pull the bulls off at 90 days once they are done with service and put them back at their their own pasture um you know we 
we look at the Kaobu ratio just depending on, we usually use maybe 18 to 20 uh, cow per bull ratio. And then depending on the size of the pasture, we usually try to throw one or two extra bulls on. And uh, especially for your second time, cows is pretty much a very tricky part to rebreed them again. So we usually try to throw it as many bulls as we can. And last year we did something to, we did something a little different. Uh, we separated all our black, the, the Angus cows. We had one pasture that had all of them. And then we had two pastures that were just all uh, Herefords in there. So we last year went ahead and threw the black bulls with the red cows and the red bulls with the black cows. And we pretty much got a really good result with the black baldies this year. There were some Herefords, but nonetheless, you know, we still got it. You know, that's where you look for your heterosis in your calves, your good genetics. And this all goes ties back into the money that you're paying for for these bulls. And then, like I said, here you go. Here's this past year's list. Um, you know, one pasture we had all Herefords, one pasture all Angus. Uh, the mix is just pretty much uh, cows mixed up that are red and black. You know, Herefords mixed, mixed, and then our replacement heifers. And then on this side, what we do is pretty much all the bulls are ear tagged with the Sidwell number and they have their trick tag number, their breed, and the dealer, date of birth, and their EPDs, and then how well they've tested during their fertility test. So uh, we'll pretty much try to group all the same bulls together. Like um, right here, we have all the Perez bulls in one pasture. Um, mainly all Perez bulls in here on our first time replacement heifers. We threw out Thompson bulls because these bulls are very low birth weight bulls on there. Okay, spring and fall branding, the fun part guys. Um, we pretty much around May is when we start doing our first round branding. Uh, everybody kind of has a idea that usually comes around. And then during um, the fall, fall in um, around August, whenever the 90 days will hit, we'll go back in and redo, uh, go second round Brandon, get whatever we missed, whatever calves were born and start our whole uh, weaning process of um, these calves. So pretty much after we push everything to to the corral, we'll go ahead and have a, a little meeting, a little prayer before we get started. Um, boss men will go ahead and assign everybody their job. We'll usually have two to four ropers that are dragging the cast in. Uh, one, two people that are out there giving the shots, being the doctor. We have an ear tagger that puts the EID tags, the 840 tags on there couple ladies will ask to take care of the paperwork. Uh, we'll have one couple people um, out there to uh, castrate the bull calves. We have one guy out there to earmark all the calves and the rest of them are ground crew. So pretty much the people that are assigned the doctrine, the earmarking, that just pretty much your job. That's all you're responsible for. Everybody else will worry about everything else. So like I said, first round, Brandon, everything's earmarked to, to the owner that the calf belongs to. And same process, we do all the shots, dehorn the calves, uh, knife cut all the bull calves. And then second round, like I said, we'll go ahead and repeat. Like I said, repeat everything, first process, uh, run everything through the chute, give them their pre-weaning vaccination write down, take a tally, and we'll count what all came through the chute. 
Um, as far as the cows, we'll run everything through the chute once we get them branding, give them their shots, look them over, uh, look at their ears. If they have a lot of ticks, put the ear spray in them, kill the ticks, um, record, write down everything. And then second round branding, same thing, we'll run them again through the chute. We'll mouth all the cows. If they're older cows, look at their teeth. If their teeth are pretty much wore down, we'll go ahead and call them, call them, put an ear tag, record um, who the owner is, and then we don't give them no shot since they're gonna go ahead and go to the cell barn or be sold. But those that are staying, they'll get uh, get their shots again, their dewormer, uh, brands written down in tally. So, so these pictures pretty much uh, just give you an idea of how we brand. Of course, it's uh, we have a lot of guys on the ground. It's an uh, old school way. We still flank, uh, tie, use a fire, uh, hot iron brand like that. Uh, as you can see, the this is back in the, the 80s, the 90s, and I was growing up down there. And then same thing, like I said, just continues to work still the same going on. And oh, and these are those EID tags, the 840 tags. So pretty much they are the first two, uh, what is it? 14, 16 digit number, the four, they're pretty much the same except for the last three numbers, they'll change. So they'll go in sequence. So each uh, each half will get their own ID tag. So it will be a little bit easier in case if we have trouble identifying something, we can just read off the number and then go back to the paperwork to say, oh, this belongs to so-and-so. So here's another um, picture or video. This was this first round when we were branded. And like you see, uh, like you see in the background, they're all black kited cows in there. You know, we have the young generation that are doing pretty much the hard work. How I grew up down there, and it is you know time for other people to learn. Uh, this is pretty much just the basic uh, the sheet. The like I was telling you, those EID tags. You know, the numbers written down right there, and pretty much just goes in sequence like that. You know, pasture where we're branding owner's name, um, if it's a steer or a heifer. And then right here, you write down, you know, the cross if it's a straight herfer, uh, herfer motley face, the uh, Angus, uh, red Angus, a uh, red white face, a black white face. And then some of the owners use their own ear tags. So like uh, right here, it says blue, blue ear tag with number 93, uh, red temple tag with the 68, uh, yellow ear tag with number seven, and then another blue temple tag with number 205. And this pretty much at least helps you, uh, they all go by 10. So when you're counting the paperwork up for the end of the day, at least you can count by tens and that makes it go faster. Okay, here we, do you have a back program? It's a pretty much a really good program. Uh, we, especially for the cast, we were going the pre pre back 45 program and we pretty much kept it the same. We modified it a little bit and then going with the cows too, we went ahead and upped it a little bit better. So during our pre breeding seasons, uh, when we fertility, test and trick test the bulls we'll go ahead and give them the calvary nine and um, multi-min 90 or whatever doctrine they may need we'll go ahead and do that before we turn them out in april uh, first time heifers they'll get their the calvary nine um stay bred vl5 
Cattle Master Go FP5 and Apora. Uh, I know uh, NSA did a workshop, uh, livestock, first a livestock workshop at um, Shiprock, and Dr. Wenzel uh, presented in a on the stay bread and the cattle master, uh, I asked him about uh, using a combination, but he said he would rather see it separate uh, instead of having it all in one shot. So that's what I did uh, this second time. So I'm gonna see how it works this coming year, this coming next year. But like I said, all, um, first round, Brandon, all calves are given their Calvary nine, in force three and their all time in uh, cows are hit same thing with um, Calvary nine multi men if they need it I uh, you know they're a little bit of a mineral unbalance here that we have so if they need a little help we'll help them out uh, cows will get their pour on then like I said ears will spray with tick and flea killer okay second round when um, we go back through Brandon, it's the same thing, same thing guess. The shots given from the first round Brandon, and then all cast will get their pre weaning shots, the Calvary nine, the Boba Shield go one shot, Pilgar, Pilgar for the pink guy, and they get injectable weaner, uh, um, wormer, I'm sorry. And then the cows, like I said, same thing, Calvary nine, multi-min if needed, and then they'll also get injectable wormer. So, uh, this is pretty much right here is what we use. Um, like I said, there's the Cattle Master Go FP5. Uh, I was using this before the Cattle Master for VL5. Uh, this is the one that Dr. Winslow is not a big fan of combining, so that's why I separated them. Uh, your pill guard for your pink guy, and then this is the stay rib that we're trying. Uh, your multi men. And then this is your Enforce 3. This is the, inter the internasal. You have to actually shoot the medicine inside their nostrils. Uh, this is their first round. Uh, the Calvary 9, I switched over from a Covex and 8 because on the Calvary 9, um, you're only given two mils per head compared to five, which is uh, a little bit easier on the calf when they get stressed out. Uh, their Boba Shield go one shot. So pretty much the second round shots are getting them ready whenever, if whoever buys the calves, they have all their shipping, their shipping stuff. Okay, we do wing these calves out. We do strip them off the mamas. Um, usually in September, we try to average or look to see when uh, 45 days prior to when we ship uh, in August we'll just um, we tried it well past two years we tried it a little different we went ahead and um, branded in August gave all the caster shots and then turned them back out with the mamas in the pasture just to help them out a little bit more so they won't be so stressed and then the for the vaccines to work a little bit better um, i know if the calves are really stressed out they pretty much block the the um how you would say the the, the what the shots are given for um, and then usually september we'll try to work um all uh, depending on how many pastures there are if there's four we'll try to work all four days so we can wean all these calves strip them off uh, we strip them off and then we hope take them to a, another facility to a crowd, different pasture, leave them in there four to six days uh, before we turn them out. Uh, we feed them hay, uh, weaning pellets, and then this year we separated the steers and the heifers and threw them on their own sides. And then now we're continuing to feed them pellets and feed them some low stress tubs. So these are pretty much the steers that we've weaned this year. As you can see, there's a variety. There's some black and white face, straight Angus, straight Hereford, 
the black and white mop base right there. As you can tell, they're pretty, pretty good. Uh, this is them inside the corral where we had them wean. And these are the weaning pallets we use. We use the pre-con Purina calf starter. So if they're all in the corral, we we'll usually feed 20 bags uh, a day. We won't feed them every day. We'll just kick them every other day or every two days, just depending and then depending on the weather. If it rains, we won't feed them out. We'll just let them be. And then right here, uh, this video right here is when we separated the steers and the heifers and we weighed them just to get an idea of uh, a base weight of what we're working at. So here's a little something. Forty-six thirty. Outside balance. So as you can tell, they weigh four thousand or six thousand four hundred something. So they pretty much averaged out that group, averaged six hundred and forty pounds. Um, so that pretty much gave was giving us a. Uh, an idea, uh, we weighed 150 steers that day and probably uh, close to 130 heifers. And the way we do, there's different market options you can look at that we, we do. I know your local options, uh, we use Cattlemen's in Las Lunas. I don't know whatever's convenient for you people in your areas, uh, these are just pretty much, um, you know, advantages, disadvantages, you know, your location is pretty open, reasonable travel for you. Uh, they're open all the time, except for holidays. Um, the market, they're wide variety. There's many buyers, many sellers. Um, when your cattle, whatever, run through the scale that day when they have auction, your checks usually ready within a couple hours. And then if you have real small lots, say like maybe uh, four, 10, 15 hit, you know, that's pretty much ideal for you to sell that way. Um, the disadvantages, of course, you have to transport them. That comes out of your pocket, you know, fuel, uh, labor, um, if your truck breaks down, your tire blows out, you know, whatever may happen that comes out of your pocket. Uh, of course, each cell barn, I'm pretty sure, will charge you their own set of fees. You have your commis commission, yardage, feed, brand inspection, beef council, and your vet inspection. And then plus, um, your cows are mingling with whatever other people bring in so you know if they're sick or something's going on with them and bad thing is it's only local buyers or sellers you don't get pretty much a wide variety of people there and then like i said this is pretty much um i had a couple years ago when i took a couple of my steers in that um were too probably too small enough to sell in the fall to come so like I said you know you look you get your your price on what each buyer bid on you get your pretty much your total you know your yardage commission fee brand inspection b council 
in your vet inspection. So you pretty much, that's what you get taken out of your check and that's what you're left with right there. And we've used video auction in the past. I remember growing up and probably in the 90s or early 2000s, we've gone through superior auction before. Um, it's pretty good. You have a very wide range of buyers that will bid on your calves. Uh, I know we used to try to get on the Rocky Mountain Classic, but we usually used to get on the Wadamaka uh, sale they used to have in Nevada because that was geared towards the southwest, this side of uh, part of the country. Um, you can accept the bids if you don't like it, you can decline and then you can wait till whenever they have the next auction to put your CAS up there. Payment is pretty much guaranteed. Um, whether something happens or not, Superior will still end up paying, paying for you. Uh, the buyer, whoever does uh, provide transportation, semis, if they have to come and get them. Um, I know, let's see. Uh, it's perfectly good for um, really big lots. I'm pretty sure if you sell a little bit more than 100 hit or if you have a pretty good, decent, uh, heavy set of calves, 80 to 100 head, I'm pretty sure they'll take them. Uh, disadvantages, they'll charge you your commission right off the top. The representative will take his cut. Whatever he feels is what he or she deserves. Um, you will get a freight adjustment if your loads are too light on the semis. They'll charge docky for that. They don't get a full load. Uh, like I said, it's not practical for real small lots. Um, the, rep the bad thing is representative. He'll, if he don't like what he sees, if thinks it's too small or sick or something, they'll pull him right off the, the scale and say they won't take him. And wherever you who whoever buys the calves, you got to get with that state and make sure you have a state clean bill of health for them entering. And you got to check to see if the calves need any additional shots or anything else that needs to go with the with them. Okay, private tree is mostly what we've been contracting the past um, couple years. You know, uh, the advantages, of course, you can negotiate your contract. You can sit with wh whatever buyer, buyers, talk about it. I want this, you want that. You can pretty much negotiate. There's no fees on top of, on top of it. They don't charge you nothing. It's pretty much what you say, the buyer say, go. The buyers, the one that arranges the transportation, hire semis or whatever they're going to use to transport it. Uh, you're, you pretty much get a, a contract right away. You sign it, and that's pretty much done right there. And some buyers uh, we had in the past will take call cows, but if they don't, you know, you just take them down to your local sale bar. Bad thing is we do do all the late work. Everything on them, like I said, from the brand in, when they cast hit the ground, everything we do, all that. Um, banking method, I remember one year when we sold the cast and when we got partial payment, they gave us a bank draft. And we did not know what a bank draft was. And the bank has never seen a bank draft like that before. So form of payment is a little bit little bit hard and you're not sure if their down payment will go through or not. Same thing, um, you know, if say if they like go to go to Texas, uh, you gotta just make sure you get your your um, clean bill of health from the state and make sure you know whatever shots they have going will work. Okay, right sure on time here. So pretty much these are the contracts on how the contracts look. Uh, you'll negotiate approximate, approximately um, 180 steers or whatever you think um, 
you put your base weight, what you will um, set your price at. Uh, you can go either a shrink or a slide. We've been going slide for the past how many years? That's up to you on how bad you want your slide to go. Same thing with heifers. We usually put heifers um, 15 to 20 cents back on what the steers would go. Um, of course, you wanna negotiate how you want them to be sold. And then this is our contract from last year. We did up our base weight uh, to 600. And the heifers were 580. 20 pounds back, and of course you do your um, your price negotiated. Uh, there was a slide and I know they, the calves were under so we didn't have to honor the slide with them. So that was a big plus. And as of today, we sold our calves. Uh, steers, we got $1.80 with a 10 site. 10 cent slide up or down. Base weight is going to be set at 580. Um, I can't remember what the heifers were going to go for, but that's pretty much what we did. Um, range management, we do control what we do operate on the range. Uh, we go with rotational grazing. You know, it helps keep the the land uh, fertile or keeps the grass coming up. You get to rest your pastures, uh, help them rebuild. I know we're doing a lot of um, CSP projects with Dr. Danny Branch in our range management. Um, just some ideas right here on what you can do to help uh, tools pretty much to help you with your rotational grazing. Um, there's a lot of pastures where we have developed the water uh, to where we didn't have water in them. That's setting up drinkers, uh, laying a lot of pipeline, replacing a lot of the old plastic and um, metal troughs that rust through. Uh, cross fencing, like I said, will pretty much help you uh, utilize your lands better, uh, especially with your rotational grazing. You can pull them out or do what you need to do with that. Uh, invasive species and natural di disasters. Uh, we have a lot of runoff going on. Um, erosion is pretty much the main concern. Uh, there's, I know we've done a couple methods. I know we put railroad ties in them to kind of help build the dirt back up. That has helped. Uh, invasive species, we pretty much went ahead and done some Toya cactus ratification with our CSP program. So that has helped us out pretty much. And the, um, pretty much this is just a, a cage for our range monitoring uh, that we do. We go out there, do our clippings and everything. Uh, and then at different pastures throughout the whole unit, we have our, uh, our um, rain gauges. So we pretty much record everything. We have a couple guys that go out and help and do that. And then, like I said, developing your water, uh, the windmill, we've pretty much gone away from the wind. We've gone through solar, which is pretty good uh, so far. Um, this, this particular setup right here, this windmill is pretty much right here. And then this tank is me looking straight down. So we were having trouble with gravity with the air locking that goes straight down to here. So we pretty much set up a dummy well. So the water from the concrete tank gets pumped all the way up here to this tank right here. And then we have a line that goes trenched all the way back down then it ties into the main line and it branches off into these different pastures. So that pretty much eliminated our problem. Uh, oh, and we've a couple pastures. We've done our rain harvesters. We've done one, three of them so far, which have come up pretty good. And then um, on this little project, uh, we have the real San Jose, just a little ways down. So on this end of the pasture, we don't have no permanent water source. So we trenched a line from the river all the way here to the storage tank. 
and at the river we can take a trash pump and hook, hook it into the river to pump water into this tank right here so that we can better utilize the pasture. And then these are just some affiliated organizations, you know, that are there to help you, you know, like I said, USDA is there. FSA um, has different programs that could help you pay for stuff. Uh, I know we use the, the LFP and we use the NAPS program is really, really good. Uh, natural resources, the, like I said, the CSP uh, programs. I don't know if you guys have gotten into Equip. We've used a lot of their programs in the past. Um, NMSU extensions, you know, all these classes, BQA, ACES, um, uh, Bull Selection, I know they, they, do, they do a ton of stuff. Uh, you know, your local agencies, I put NSA because that's pretty much local for, for all of you that are out there and like how it came on before, you know, all the different programs. Um, Depot Farm and Ranch Insurance, these guys are based out of Texas. Uh, if you guys ever heard of drought insurance, these guys are the ones that are into um, the ones that do that program that deal with, deal with. And this is a really, really good program. Um, speaking with their reps, I know Navajo Nation does have a policy, but I do not know uh, how that works i'm pretty sure you would probably have to ask your chapter houses or whoever deals with the range unit for navajo nation so any questions comments i know actually whipped it through <laughs> right away or made it within the whole time Mr. Romero, this is Marge Lantana. I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Right um, thank you for your fantastic uh, presentation. Yeah. I was always interested in how an association um, uh, performs their group uh, contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, um, you have, I think you mentioned like you have 31 uh, owners or 31 uh, members to your association. Yeah. Are the cows, um, the cows, the head of cows distribute equally to the 31 association members? That's question one. And then okay. the question two is, how much do they pay? Do, is there a fee, an association fee they pay? And then does an association pay the, um, the Pueblo tribe for the land? Those are the okay. three questions I have. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, your first question on the cows. Um, whenever a new member enters, they can purchase cows from the association or from the members if the members feel like selling any of them. Um, I know when I first first got in or um, the, 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 the brand I inherited from my grandma and it was distrib distributed to my dad and my two uncles. So I had ended up getting um, it was like maybe six cows. So from there, I pretty much um, every year just kept back whatever heifers we were allowed to. But no, it, it's, the number of cows is up to the owner how many they want to own. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, yes, but what if the association member wants to like, own like maybe 50 heads and will that um well will that cause like um some uh over capacity of your oh. pasture okay um yeah we we pretty much try to keep a limit about 30 head per member okay and yeah. then and okay. then 
yeah and then when we um when it comes to replacement heifers we'll um, put a set number as to how many each member can hold back except for those newer members will say they can keep all their heifers to help them build up. Mm -hmm. So that that part, um, you, I can't remember what your second question was. <laughs> oh gosh, oh uh, what was it? Uh, I think I, that was a grazing fee. Okay, the um, grazing fee or um, association fee. Okay, um, if you bring your own cattle in, you you are assessed, I think it's like a $10, $10 uh, per head fee, but you have to have a clean bill of health if you bring your own cows in to join. And then um, your third question, we do pay grazing fees to the, to the tribe, to the ENRD. Um, it just, uh, the, the amount per head, it, it, it is really left up to the to the tribe on how much they want to charge us. I know it used to just be a, a pretty much a, um, a fixed limit, like a, a cow would be $3 per head, a horse would be $5 a head, a bull would be like eight, nine bucks a head, but that is pretty much fluctuating, but we do pay uh, grazing fees that go back to the, to the tribe. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. I guess I have another question. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, the association participates in these federal uh, programs like uh, NRCS. Okay, who is usually the applicant? Is it the association works directly with NRCS and then, uh, or is it the individual uh, association member? Who does um, the contract directly with NRCS? Okay, um, that it's the association has their own um, EIN number. So okay. it's pretty, so it's pretty so each association does have an EIN number because we all do our own CSP equip uh, projects differently. So it's pretty much the officers that are the ones that uh, say, you know, um, this is a project that we have in mind or we'll take projects that the association members have in mind and we'll put take that to um, an RCS or FSA and say, hey, this is what we plan on doing to improve um, improve our range management or water system. And the pretty much the president is the one that has the power of signature to sign for that contract. So like I said, it, it pretty much all ties back into your bylaws because um, we do have to send a letter into these uh, USDA, uh, NRCS, FSA, a change over a power on who are, who has pretty much a signature over the association. I have a question. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. I have a question. All right, go for it. This is on Larita Largo. And mm -hmm. your presentation is so awesome where it could awesome. be developed in one night and get approved the next day. Mm -hmm. But my question, by listening to all your presentation, uh, you indicated um, different type of medication for the vaccination. And then do you, do you as an individual uh, consumer, uh, does a consumer, um, agreed a certain date for your um, auction sale, sale auction? Like, um, uh, like when we um, look at a, a day to ship? Yes. Um, yeah, usually, like I said, we usually try to 
we used to ship usually around Oct the end or the middle of October, but since we're kind of trying something new with, like I said, just leaving the calves in with their mamas for a couple weeks and then pulling them off. So the past two years, we've been shipping around the middle of November. So we usually, we we'll usually try to shoot for the first week of November or the second week in November, but that also just depends on, um, on your buyer to leave a couple of dates, uh, some options open. Okay, and then the other thing is that um, uh, um, I may have not heard, or maybe I did hear, but do you, um, is this more like a, a huge acre where it's divided up and based on the, the, the individual applies for the um, equip? Is that how it works too as well? No, it's the same thing as um uh, as uh blah, blah, blah. um it's an open range, not the word. Yeah, it's pretty much open range. Like I said, we uh no individual can apply for for the equip or CSP because you do need that EIN number and then okay. I know from from a, a tax financial standpoint you do have yeah. if an individual applies you do have to give them your social security card and you will have to report that money yes so that i know a couple associations have done that and they've gotten in trouble oh wow yeah so that's why we the the each individual association doesn't um doesn't do that it's done done with the, um, like I said, the EIN, the, the officers are the ones that take care of that. Okay. Well, I'm really interested in the vaccination portion. Um, this, oh, is yeah. really, this is really interesting uh, to hear again. So uh, we may have known everything, but we always, I, I like to learn something new every time I hear about uh, aquaculture or livestock matters. Oh yeah. Alrighty. Well, yeah, like I said, if you guys have more questions, um, feel free to ask. <laughs> well, this presentation, the PowerPoint be available? I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I spoke to Jesse and she said it'll probably be, probably be up on the website okay. or be available. Okay. Well, I sure enjoy your presentation. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Hey, Stuart, this is Dean Gamble. Hi. Have you guys, has your association ever tried the, the bat native beef deal that's going on? Thank you. Uh, we've talking, we've talked to Kim Yazi in the past about doing the whole bat thing. And our deal was, is we try to sell all these calves at one time. And they, they they'll pick and sort off i guess whatever don't meet the weight and they'll and whatever's not structural because we had a lot of the i we had a lot of the herefords and they kind of did, didn't really want the herefords uh we there's a couple associations that have worked with labat uh the past couple of years and um we talked to producers from akama too and they they've kind of had a negative experience. So I I really don't know how um, how um, their program is now if it's still the same or if it's changed, but we tr we just kind of don't like the the way it is. They're pretty much how their their standards are set. That's one thing we kind of but heads on. Yeah, but, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, so, I must think what's going on. See, she can't. She can't blame me because I didn't get, try to give away her show line this time. <laughs> <laughs> I got on and I heard my show lamb was about. <laughs> <to say. laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I said I was the one that tried to give it away the last time. <laughs> For everyone in there in the audience, that lamb is not harmed. Somewhere else, but yeah, don't I try to give stuff away that don't belong to me. <laughs> But if um yeah, like I said, if you guys have any questions about certain projects or how we've done our water lines, uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff I didn't get to take pictures of. Um, just let me know. We, we're always here to help help each other on different topics. Or if I can rent out those young men if you guys need help. So. How about um, that bull fertility test? So do you ever come across some bulls that um, I guess I should say don't pass that fertility test, but do you retest them? Or what do you do with them? Well, did, 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 did. A couple of years ago, there was one or two that tested poor. And then we took him back in April and he still tested poor. So we just sent him to the cell bar. And then uh, bull and when you purchase bulls like that, pretty much um, in our past experience, they are pretty much guaranteed sound. So if whatever reason, if uh, they don't pass their trick test or they get crippled or something, uh, the seller will pretty much give you a discount on further purchases. Um, I know uh, did it. for Perez uh, bull sale, he gave us a discount because we had one of his uh, bulls, uh, he got struck by lightning. So he gave us a discount this past year on that bull. Okay. Any more if, if questions? That, um, I want to put it out there. If, if anybody wants to uh, buy one of those bulls, we usually use them till they're about six or seven, then we'll just take them to the sale barn. But I'm pretty sure if any of you guys are interested in purchasing one we could probably end up working on a on a price uh, negotiate a price like I said they're registered so papers will go with you once he gets bought I had a question yeah hello um I was a little late to the presentation um I was wondering where you guys are, are based out of out of here the Pueblo of Laguna okay Yeah, for those that just hopped in like in the middle of the presentation or a little later than that, this session is recorded. So it will be on our YouTube channel in case you have missed the first half. Thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> okay, so if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and move on to our announcement. Um, thank you again, Stuart, for that information. A lot goes into a cattle co-op, a lot of ranchers that are within your association. That is a lot, though. <laughs> so I'm not sure how you all maintain it, but you guys are doing pretty well for yourselves. Um, but thank you again. So if you guys all want to um ask them some questions um feel free to go ahead and uh Stuart I'm not sure how you want to correspond to some questions that they might have later on that they can't think of right now so maybe you can jot down an email or something but um with that being said thank you Jesse? all for joining us oh, go ahead sorry Jesse, Jesse this is Larita the, present, ahead, like I said, the presentation was awesome, but I'm more interested in the medication. Can he provide an email in regard to what he provided on, on hand before us? And I'd like to get to know some of those medication. 
Yeah, I'm. We're gonna go ahead and post the um, PowerPoint onto our our website, and then you can get a look. Um, you know, at the medication that he uses, and then also, um, we will be having a a herd health. Um, we'll be collaborating with the Net College Land Grant Office in Shiprock to provide a herd health workshop. Um, it's going to be an all day thing. So if you want to know more about the medication, when to give it, um, you know, and, and what each medication does for the cattle, you can, um, it, it, I know it's a ways from Crown Point, but we do have that in person if you want to discuss it more. So um, I, I'll have it online. And Stuart, if you want to uh, give uh, um, go back well it's, it's already off um, a list of the medication that you use yeah sure sure then I can um, give uh, Jesse my contact information so if anybody wants to get a hold of me for uh, and yeah like you said any more questions or the vaccine questions you know that would be a way to get a hold of me too Okay, great. Um, thank you, Stuart, again. Hey, Stuart. Thank you. Yeah. And tell your dad you're out there for me. How going? At? All right. I sure will. Thank you. All right. So um, thank you again, Stuart. So just to let you guys know that our next webinar is going to be posted or will be um, presented next week on salt cedar control and rangeland seeding this will be presented by casey speckman he is our nmsu rangeland specialist this will be on tuesday november 1st starting at 5 30 p.m so thank you all for joining this this evening and hope you guys have a good night thank you Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Good night, Good sis. Good night. Good night. Uh, just an overview, the Navajo Sustainable Agriculture Project is a New Mexico Cooperative Extension Service initiative delivered in collaboration with our project partners. And one of them is the Nate College Land Grant Office. And the other project partner of ours is COPE, uh, which stands for Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment. Our project is funded by USDA Outreach and Assistance for Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers and Veteran Farmers and Ranchers Program. So that's who we are funded by. Um, and next slide, the NSA project objectives and goals is to improve the operations, profitability and sustainability of socially disadvantaged Navajo farmers and ranchers and veteran farmers and ranchers. We also encourage the increase of our producers knowledge in many of the USDA programs that they have to offer from NRCS, FSA, RD, and RMA that you guys are all aware of and services of those that other resource providers. We also have the increased the local production and consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy foods by novel families and individuals. So that pretty much sums up all of our um, objectives and goals for the NSA project. So um, Stuart, if you want to go ahead and maybe share your screen, I'll stop sharing mine.